When talking about radial engines, one can't help but think of spluttering, smoke puffing, roaring, goosebumps giving, massive air-cooled airplane engines. But that's not how the radial engine started out. And to solve cooling problems, the first ever radial engine was water-cooled. This first radial engine held the record for the best power-to-weight ratio of any engine for many years, which is impressive considering that it was first built in 1901, even before the first powered flight of 1903. However, this engine was a rotary engine that was converted to a radial. The rotary was different from the radial in that the rotary's crankshaft was bolted to the airframe and the propeller fixed to the engine. The cylinders thus would spin with the propeller around the stationary crankshaft. The rotary engine overshadowed the early radials and right off the bat had some advantages. For one, the weight of the spinning cylinders acted as a flywheel which resulted in smooth running without the need for a separate flywheel which lowered engine weight. The spinning cylinders also made better air cooling, even with the engine on the ground at idle. But that's as far as the advantages go. And around 1920, the rotary had reached its peak. This was partly due to the fuel and air being drawn in through the hollow crankshaft, which would limit the amount of air it could pull in. And limited air is limited power. Rotaries also couldn't be easily scaled up to increase power output, as the increased mass of the spinning cylinders caused significant gyroscopic precession, much more than a propeller alone would cause. Additionally, advances in cooling fins design and manufacturing resulted in the air-cooled radials starting to show significant advantage over the rotaries, and radial engines basically ruled the skies for at least the next 20 years. Inline engines also became popular during this period, even before the radial did, and during World War II, inline engines peaked. And note that when I say inline engines, I'm using the terminology of the time period, referring mostly to V engines, which were two rows of inline cylinders angled around the crankshaft to form a V. It was the V12 that posed the biggest competition to the radial engines throughout World War II. But radial engines won out over the inline types in many aspects, and despite one major disadvantage, were better suited to most applications. But even so, it wasn't the leading airplane engine type for much longer. But we'll get to that. So let's look at the basic operation of the radial engine to get a general idea of why it is such a great cylinder layout. The radial engine has its cylinders spaced evenly around the crankshaft and usually have between 3 and 9 cylinders. However, one major benefit of the radial was that more rows of cylinders could be added to increase the total displacement while still keeping the engine relatively short. This is a feat not possible with the V engines, as adding more cylinders would make an engine already too long for most applications even longer. Four-stroke radials almost always have an odd number of cylinders in a single row to ensure an evenly spaced out firing order by starting with cylinder one and firing every other cylinder. In the case of a five-cylinder radial, the firing order will be one, three, five, two, four, and back to cylinder one. A full revolution of a four-stroke engine is 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation. So after firing cylinder one, firing intervals are every 144 degrees of revolution until it completes the full 720 degrees and starts again. This equally spaced firing order and smooth firing interval isn't possible if a four-stroke radial has an even number of cylinders and will result in an undesirable uneven firing interval. Of course, four-stroke radials can have an even total cylinder count by using multiple rows of uneven cylinders and maintain a smooth firing interval. Two rows of seven cylinders being a 14-cylinder radial like the Wright R2600 and two rows of nine cylinders being an 18-cylinder radial like the Pratt & Whitney R2800 double wasp. 
Another key difference between the radial and most other piston engine layouts is the crankshaft. With inline, V and boxer engines, each conrod is usually directly connected to the crankshaft, with each having its own dedicated plane of rotation. On the radial, the cylinders and pistons are coplanar, with the conrods sharing the same plane of rotation. This means that each conrod cannot connect directly to the crankshaft without complex forked connecting rods, which has been attempted, but never successfully. The solution is a spider crank pin bearing assembly that each conrod can connect to. However, all conrods can't have a fixed connection to the crank pin bearing assembly due to its movement and thus requires articulating wrist pin connections. But all conrods can't have an articulating wrist pin connection to the bearing assembly or the bearing assembly would have a large degree of rotating freedom which would compromise the position of the pistons in the cylinders. For this reason, only cylinder once conrod has a fixed connection with a crankshaft called a master conrod to restrict the rotation of the assembly and also house the wrist pin connections for the other conrods. Radial engines doesn't have camshafts but uses a single cam ring to operate the valves via push rods. The cam ring has two rows, one for the intake valves and one for the exhaust valves. The cam ring turns in the opposite direction of the crankshaft by use of a two sprocket gear mechanism. Radial engines typically have perfect primary balance, which is the term used to describe the vibrations caused by the reciprocating and rotating mass of the pistons, crankshaft and the big ends of the connecting rods. By using the correctly calculated weight on the crankshaft counterweights, both the reciprocating momentum of the pistons as well as the rotating motion of the crankshaft and conrod bottom ends are cancelled out. As for secondary balance, in the shortest possible explanation, secondary imbalance happens due to the conrods tilting sideways and then going straight again repeatedly. This tilting motion changes the relative vertical length of the conrod and causes the piston to travel faster at the top half of a cylinder and slower at the bottom half of the cylinder. This results in piston acceleration and deceleration which causes vibrations. It is important to remember that the secondary imbalance happens twice per crankshaft revolution. And with the crankshaft counterweight spinning the same speed as the crankshaft, it cannot cancel out the secondary imbalance. The only way to cancel out the secondary imbalance without using a balance shaft spinning twice the revolution of the crankshaft, which the radial does not incorporate, is that the pistons themselves cancel out each other's secondary imbalance, like for example the Boxer 4, Boxer 6 and Inline 3 can. So can the pistons of the radial engine cancel out each other's secondary imbalance? Yes, but not fully, and here's why. The direction of the secondary imbalance force of a reciprocating piston is in an upwards direction or away from the crankshaft when the conrod is straight. That's with the piston at top dead center and bottom dead center. And the imbalance direction is downwards or towards the crankshaft when the conrod is fully tilted, which is with the piston roughly midway up or down the cylinder. So with this information regarding the direction of the secondary imbalance, we can come to some sort of conclusion regarding the secondary imbalance of radial engines. Looking at this illustration, the white arrows show the direction of secondary imbalance of each piston at each point in time of rotation, determined by the conrod position, upright or fully tilted, as previously explained. It also only shows the direction of the secondary imbalance and not the magnitude of the secondary imbalance. Rotate the crankshaft to any position. At any point in time there would be a small resultant imbalance. In this position for example the net secondary imbalance direction of these four cylinders point in an upwards direction like this. This is opposite in direction but larger in force than cylinder 1's imbalance. So the imbalance force of these four cylinders goes past cancelling out cylinder 1's imbalance but overpowers it to cause a resultant upwards imbalance like this. All that said, keep in mind that the magnitude of the secondary imbalance forces are much smaller than the magnitude of primary imbalance forces. 
It's also to be noted that radial engines usually have relatively long connecting rods due to engine design. And the longer the con rod, the less the maximum tilting angle of the con rod when the piston is mid-stroke. This means the acceleration and deceleration of the piston due to the sideways going con rod is less and reduces the magnitude of the secondary vibrations. And lastly, adding more rows of cylinders to a radial engine makes it possible for one row of cylinders to a large extent cancel out the secondary imbalance of the other row of cylinders. So while the radial engine does not have perfect secondary balance, it is a reasonably well-balanced cylinder layout, evidenced by the large-scale past use of the radial, as well as the fact that no radial engine I've ever heard of uses a balance shaft. Earlier I mentioned one major disadvantage of the radial engine and that's its massive frontal area which creates a lot of drag compared to other cylinder layouts like the V12. The V12 for example allows for more streamlined cowls and airplane front ends which enables longer range and more fuel efficient operation. Radial engines of World War II usually created quite a bit more power than their V12 counterparts and in most cases the additional power overcame the additional drag caused by its massive frontal profile. But another disadvantage of multiple row radials is cooling airflow. The front cylinders get clean direct airflow, but the cylinders in the rows behind it won't get as much direct cold air. Inline engines would have an even bigger airflow problem, but these were usually water-cooled, eliminating this problem. But during the war, the water-cooled engines were known to be not as bulletproof as the air-cooled radials, as even one well-positioned bullet from an enemy aircraft could rupture a coolant hose or coolant tank, causing a coolant leak and a soon-to-seize-up engine. This was a problem the air-cooled radial engines didn't have. And radial-powered aircraft have been known to return home from sorties with cylinders blown off, but still producing some power. But how do we get from a point where radials were arguably the best cylinder layout and the pinnacle of reciprocating internal combustion engine design at the end of World War II to where it is today, which is absolutely nowhere? After the Second World War, two things happened that ultimately spelled the end of massive production of radial engines. Radial engines possess the versatile quality to be effectively scaled from only a few horsepower up to thousands of horsepower, like the Pratt & Whitney 71 litre 4300 horsepower or 4360 WASP major. However, after the war, turbine engines saw rapid development and very soon were easily outpowering even the most powerful radial engines quickly becoming the new norm for high power and high thrust requirements. Turbine engines aren't as fuel efficient as radial engines or as cheap to manufacture, but they easily produce more thrust and are more reliable. And in a post-war world with demand for long-distance civilian airline travel, this was a big deal. There was no way the radial engine, or any reciprocating engine for that matter, could compete with turbine engines on performance or reliability. Airlines wasn't the only air travel becoming popular in the decades after the war, and interest in private aviation exploded, and with it the need for simple, lightweight, fuel-efficient airplane engines. Radials stood no chance here, either competing with more cost-effective, horizontally opposed four- and six-cylinder engines. The radial's big frontal profile doesn't help matters either, with a need for more sleek, lower-drag light aircraft, which the Boxer 4 and 6 cylinder engines were much better suited to. Radials did live on for a few more decades in more niche markets like crop dusters and fire bombers where purchase cost and fuel efficiency were very important until eventually that too was mostly replaced by turboprop power plant options. The radial didn't disappear completely though and today there are a few options to buy new low horsepower radial engines. Most common examples of modern radials are from Rotec and Werner, with Rotec offering a 110 and 150 horsepower version and Werner offering engines ranging from 42 horsepower to 158 horsepower. 
While it's great that the radial is being kept alive, these modern radials offer little of the magic that was the massive air-cooled behemoths of World War II. But it is still possible to experience these engines on warbirds and at air shows, even if the surviving numbers unfortunately are getting fewer and fewer by the year.